Press record. Okay. Um, and I'll kill the lights too. So I'm pretty excited about what we're going to talk about today because it's just crazy fun uh, for me. It's a lot of drawing, but it's kind of fun that there are qualitative rules you can learn that get you reasonably close to the predictions of pretty high level calculations. Um, our goal is to be able to make sensible predictions about the structure and reactivity of organic molecules when we're in the lab and not sitting in front of a computer or, or, or able to run calculations. Um, all right, so I mentioned last time I wanted you to go through and, and make sure you understood the first section. We talked a lot about valence bond theory, which is where we think about bonds as being localized between uh, two, two electrons, localized between two atoms. Uh, it, we talked about the necessity of hybrid orbitals to get the directionality right so that individual atomic orbitals can overlap to form bonds. Uh, we talked about how you uh, don't need to have integral values for the little subscript or superscript on the P for hybrid orbitals. You're used to SP1, SP2, and SP3 orbitals, but um, that index is, uh, hybridization index is uh, more of a, number that tells you the relative ratio of one of these orbitals to another. So for example, sp3.4 is one part s, 3.4 parts p, and if you run the numbers out, those are three orbitals that are 77% p. Yeah? Real quick, how do they get the bond, like the angle of the lone pair? Um, you don't. Uh, so this is the bond angle, uh, which you can measure experimentally. And with that, you can calculate uh, hybridization index. I went ahead and calculated what would be left for the lone pair. Your text doesn't do this, but um, if you assume you only have three p orbitals and one s orbital to use, and you figure out how much you use here, you can calculate how much is left for the lone pair. Um, and in both of these cases, it's sort of interesting to observe that um, the lone pairs are more S rich than uh, would have been predicted by just calling them SP3, right? If, if you're thinking about lone pairs in water or ammonia, you may have typically thought of those lone pairs as being in an SP3 type orbital. It's a decent approximation, but actually they're more S rich than that. And this makes sense because uh, increased S characters associated with larger electronegativity. So S orbitals penetrate to the nucleus. The wave function has a defined value at the nucleus, and so that should be um, uh, stabilizing because the electron gets to be very close to the nucleus, and therefore it makes sense that lone pairs would be higher in S character because they're just there and they're not shared with any other atoms. All right. So... Um, a couple more concepts are necessary for uh, valence bond theory. Uh, I guess number five on our list is resonance. And uh, in valence bond theory, you don't make the connection between resonance and molecular orbitals. You just say that there are two Lewis structures or more Lewis structures that both describe a molecule and reality is a hybrid of the two resonance structures. Um, and there is a concept in valence bond theory that resonance is stabilizing. Um, and then, yeah, so if you combine those concepts together, you get the typical working model of the atom that <coughs> and molecules that many people are comfortable with. Um, in organic chemistry, we tend to couple, it's convenient to use valence bond theory because a lot of our reactions involve changing in one or two bonds, and so it's useful to think about bonds. Though there are uh, some concepts that most organic chemists bring in from molecular orbital theory that are useful, and, and so take a hybrid approach. And some of these concepts that we mix um, in a <coughs> valence bond theory MO hybrid is the concept of antibonding orbitals. 
And so uh, you may have been taught at some point in the past that you could take an SP, um, I don't know, three type orbital on say a CH3 group and combine it with a similar sp3 orbital on another ch3 group and you combine them in phase and out of phase to get a bonding orbital and an antibonding orbital we know now that of course the antibonding orbital is always more destabilized than the bonding orbital is stabilized. And I'm sorry, that's not pretty or symmetric. This is what you get with me drawing on the fly. Um, looks like we lost a little yellow dot there. Um, and, and you may have thought, okay, well, the bonding orbital is going to look something like this with most of the electron density in between the two atoms and the antibonding orbital is going to look like this with most of the electron density pointing out away uh, from the two atoms, all right? And with a node in the middle. So that should look decently familiar to you. We might have called this a sigma star and a sigma bond. And in, in most cases, we thought about bonds as coming from two uh, electrons shared in a bonding orbital with an empty antibonding orbital that's high in energy. Um, another place where bringing in MO concepts is useful um, is in conjugated pi systems. So uh, the classic example of this is the allyl anion or cation or radical. We'll just choose the allyl um, cation, carbon atoms 1, 2, and 3. And of course, resonance tells you that the double bond can be between carbons 1 and 2 or between 2 and 3, but that the positive charge is only ever on atoms uh, 1 and 3. So hopefully this should look familiar. And, and the concept that we bring in from MO theory is that we can explain this resonance by mixing together three p orbitals in all possible phase combinations to get three new pi orbitals. We don't call them pi star anymore, or pi because there's more than one of them. Uh, the lowest energy one we sort of represent by having three p orbitals adjacent to each other in phase. And then, of course, the highest energy one uh, we represent as having the three p orbitals next to each other out of phase. The one in the middle is a little bit weird and uh, it comes out of the predictions of MO theory and there's actually a pretty straightforward way of, of getting it, uh, but we won't worry about it in this part of our discussion. Uh, and then having filled up those orbitals, uh, or having drawn the orbitals and, and ordered them in energy, uh, you can fill them up with the available electrons. We have two pi electrons, and now you can decide that uh, pi 1 is your homo for your molecule, where uh, showing you that these electrons are delocalized across all three nuclei, which is exactly what resonance tells you. And then the lumo, the empty orbital, uh, uh, the, the MO picture for, of the pi system tells you that the LUMO is on atoms 1 and 3, but not on 2. Um, and so most organic chemists are fairly comfortable with this uh, picture of molecules that allows us to focus on bonds, but also remember electron delocalization. And that's fine, and, and we will probably in this class stick to that for the most part. However, there's a whole other world out there that I discovered when I read chapter one that I think you should know about. And um, so if we were to step over to the pure molecular orbital theory world, the um, biggest way, the best way I could maybe describe this is that we consider molecules as having fully delocalized 
molecular orbitals formed from, and I'm going to use an abbreviation here, linear combinations of atomic orbitals. Uh, and we consider valence orbitals only. So if your atom is, say, methane, you say, what alphabet of atomic orbitals do I have? Well, I have four 1s orbitals from each, one from each hydrogen. And then on carbon, I have four valence orbitals, a 2s, and then three of the 2p orbitals. Um, and the other major concept from molecular orbital theory is bond? What bond? <laughs> two electrons are no longer uh, localized between two nuclei. Rather, they are delocalized over the whole molecule. Um, MO theory is really good at explaining structure and reactivity of molecules uh, and, is, and conjugated pi systems. MO theory needs no such thing as resonance or hyperconjugation to explain electron delocalization. Uh, you can think of resonance as a patch on valence bond theory that helps explain uh, electron delocalization in, in certain circumstances. MO theory needs no resonance because MO theory doesn't draw bonds in the same way. Um, the disadvantage is as molecules get bigger, it becomes more and more complicated uh, and you lose focus on the bonds and functional groups that change in organic reactions. Um, however, you shouldn't think of valence bond theory and molecular orbital theory as being mutually exclusive. In fact, it can be shown through maths that I don't understand that they're actually fully equivalent and you can actually translate the results from one into results from the other. Um, many programs allow you to do this. In Gaussian you can tick a little button that says actually I want to see localized uh, bonding orbitals and it will show you that and the picture you get is fully equivalent to what you would get from, uh, from MO theory. Um, one of the reasons for this is, remember, we're describing our wave function for a molecule as a Slater determinant in which we can't really even tell where an individual electron is. It contributes, an individual electron contributes a portion of orbital occupancy for all of the orbitals in the molecule. So in that way, it doesn't matter. Ooh, I'm slapping the mic. Sorry, Samantha. In that way, it doesn't matter how you slice things up as long as you're taking care of uh, all of the electrons in the molecule. So uh, we're going to develop a qualitative way of dealing with MO theory on a deeper level in the same way that we have uh, done for our antibonding orbitals and pi systems. Um, and so your book introduces something called qualitative molecular orbital theory for which there are 14 rules. And in my chapter one notes, I wrote them out. I don't want to write them out here. Uh, because I feel like it would be easier to discuss the rules while we actually draw and talk through making some of these orbitals, okay? Uh, but just to begin, qualitative molecular orbital theory, or QMOT, we like to pronounce acronyms. A um, couple of things to get started. We're going to use valence orbitals only. Actually, in the in the calculations I've looked at so far in Gaussian, they do include core orbitals, but there's really never anything interesting that goes on there. Um, we're going to uh, form completely delocalized MOs as linear combinations of atomic orbitals. And the orbitals we make, and this is an interesting point that requires some illustration, the MOs that we make must be either Here's some words you hate, symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to, and I'm going to say this in a different way that hopefully makes sense. Your book says with respect to the symmetry operations of the molecule, with respect to the molecule's symmetry. What do we mean by that? Well, suppose that we have a molecule 
we're just going to put M there for molecule, some atom in the middle. Suppose it's trigonal planar. Uh, for those of you that like space groups and stuff, this would be the D3H point group. Uh, what do we mean by symmetry features of the molecule? Well, um, this molecule has a C3 axis of symmetry running straight down the middle of the molecule. If you rotate it 120 degrees, it's the same thing. On each of these MH bonds, you have a C2 axis of symmetry, meaning that you can stick your molecular skewer through this hydrogen M bond and then spin around it 180 degrees and you got the same thing. And there's three of those C2 axes, one for each MH bond. And then if we were to look at um, the molecule from above, we would see that there are also mirror planes of symmetry, which I'm going to illustrate with a solid purple line, one here, one there, and one there, where everything on one side is a reflection of what's on the other. And then you actually have another mirror plane of symmetry which coincides with all the bonds in the molecule. Okay, so any molecular orbital we would make for this MH3 molecule would need to be either symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to the symmetry. Symmetric means the uh, sign of the wave function doesn't change. And anti-symmetric means wave function sign changes. So as an example, in this uh, trigonal planar geometry, let's use like methyl cation. One of the orbitals of methyl cation we will see is just an unhybridized p orbital. And um, if you consider the C2, I'm sorry, the C3 axis, this p orbital would be symmetric with respect to that c3 axis because we rotate 180 degrees and nothing changes, right? On the other hand, it is anti-symmetric with respect to the c2 axis because you flip that thing over, right? If I did that rotation, what I would get is an orbital that would look like that where the sign is opposite. Okay, So that's going to be a guideline for the kinds of things we're going to draw. They've either got to be symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to the various symmetry operations for the molecule. All right. With that, um, our approach is going to be to start with very simple structures and then distort them a little bit from their simplicity and uh, see what changes. So um, let's go ahead and do this for um, CH3. All right, we're going to call this qualitative molecular orbital theory picture of CH3. We're going to define a coordinate system. I don't care to know whether it's left-handed or right-handed, but we'll just say uh, y is coming out at you. x and z are in the plane of the page. x going up, z going to our right. Uh, and we're going to start, CH3, we're going to start, we're not going to say whether it's radical, cation, or anion. Let's just begin uh, with the trigonal planar structure. And let's say that all the CH bonds are in uh, the XY plane. And let's remind ourselves that each hydrogen contributes, and I have three of them, a 1s orbital, and then the carbon contributes a 2s, 2px aligned along the x-axis, 2py on the y-axis, and 2pz. Okay. 
So far, so good. We're going to mix these together. And again, uh, if we draw our trigonal planar structure, anything we draw in terms of an orbital has to be either symmetric or anti-symmetric with respect to this molecule's symmetry. Okay, so what should our first option be uh, when you're mixing things together in all possible combinations, an easy one is, well, to start with the lowest energy orbitals you have and to put them together all in phase, all right? So on carbon, the lowest energy orbital we have, and I'm gonna copy this, methyl, uh, this trigonal planar CH3 because we're gonna be drawing it again and again. On carbon, the lowest energy orbital we have is the 2s orbital, right? And you can imagine 1s orbitals on each of the uh, adjacent hydrogens being uh, in contact with that 2s orbital. And you can imagine them being together in phase. So we'll call this orbital A. And what it is, it's the 2s on carbon plus 1s plus 1s plus 1s. All right. Um, if we were to actually run uh, some kind of uh, calculation on this molecule, what we would see for this orbital is just sort of a fully delocalized blob. roughly planar in shape, connecting the overlapping all of the atoms, okay? Now that orbital's character is definitely CH bonding in character uh, because you've got the space between carbon and hydrogens uh, with the same phase of the wave function, but it's not attributable to any single CH bond. That's two, that'd be two electrons in that uh, orbital delocalized over the whole molecule. Let's see if this keeps our symmetry principle. Is it symmetric with respect to, <coughs> excuse me, the symmetry operations of the molecule? Yeah, well, you could spin this around the z-axis and it would look the same. By uh, Spin it by 120 degrees uh, along the c3 axis of the molecule and you get the same thing. Um, okay. At the same time, it might be useful for us to just draw the uh, sort of out of phase option. And for each of these, oops, I didn't want to do that. For each of these orbital mixing issues, you're going to have the in phase sort of plus option, and then you're going to have the out of phase minus option. Uh, this would look just sort of the same as we drew it schematically, only we're going to have the hydrogens be not the same phase as the carbon. And we'd expect this to kind of be an antibonding orbital. So there we go. Um, question so far? Okay. What do we do with the various p orbitals? Well, let's see what we can do with uh, our x orbital. So our x orbital would have been pointing up along the x-axis and then back down. Maybe I want to make that just a little smaller. OK. Um, what do you recommend I do with the hydrogens? Can you see any way that p orbital along the x-axis could overlap with 1s orbitals on the hydrogens? This one looks like it could be direct head on, right? And then how about on the bottom? It maybe wouldn't hit them directly, but if you put both of those in the same phase, there could be some kind of overlap, right? 
if you were to run uh, the calculation on this particular uh, molecule and visualize these orbitals, uh, what you would observe would look something like this where you'd have a lobe of electron density on the top and then a lobe of electron density on shoot yep there we go on the bottom and and interestingly this uh, we're going to call this a group orbital for our CH3 group uh, this group orbital has what we're going to call pi symmetry in the sense that it looks like a p orbital. It's got a horizontal node in between the two of them. And this was a really interesting insight for me as I was learning this is when you mix the s orbitals together you get something that has sort of sigma symmetry. Uh, no nodes uh, and uh, mirror uh, symmetry, whereas if you mix a p orbital with some other things, you tend to have a pi type orbital. So we're going to see that this a orbital is sort of a sigma type orbital, whereas uh, this orbital, which we'll call b, is sort of a pi type orbital. And by calling it sigma versus pi type, I'm talking about the kinds of interactions it might form with other molecules. Yeah? Could you walk through how that um, orbital meets the symmetry requirements of the molecule? Good. How does this orbital meet the symmetry requirements of the molecule? Um, let's look at it from the side and you'll see that it... Um, oh, okay. No, actually... Um, I'm going to copy it so I can draw some of these things. First, if you run the C2 axis down the middle of the molecule, down one of these carbon-hydrogen bonds, rotate it 180 degrees, that takes the proton in the front and trades its place with the proton in the back. So it's, it's symmetric there. It's also symmetric, let's see, this is the P, this is from our PX orbital. This is also symmetric with respect to the XZ plane, which is the, actually the plane of the board, right? What's in front is symmetric with respect to what's in back. Yeah? Um, what would happen if I decided to make one of these hydrogens pink? Uh -huh. Would it break the rules? Um, Just like when you flip it 180 degrees, they would switch spots. Well, um, what, you're, exactly what you're describing is basically constructing the same type of orbital, only with a different p orbital, right? If I made these two yellow and this one pink, but then I had the p orbital coming back this way, it would form the same kind. Yeah. Like, uh, do we have to meet all the, the different kinds of symmetry from the molecule? No, just one. Okay, so as long as we hit at least one. Yeah, we got to hit at least one, but not all of them. That's that's an important point that I didn't make. So let me say it again. In order for these orbitals to be okay, you must meet the symmetric versus anti-symmetric requirement with respect to at least one of the symmetry features of the molecule but doesn't have to be all. In fact, it can't be all, right? Um, this one doesn't satisfy the C3 axis that goes through, which is our Z axis. Okay. Um, let's, uh, other questions? Yeah. So the symmetry requirement only has to work for one of Yep, only has to work for one of the features, one of the symmetry features of the molecule. Could we combine two p orbitals in a way that gives us something different? Um, I don't 
think so because the p orbitals are orthogonal to each other. Um, orthogonal in geometry means 90 degrees with respect to each other, but actually it's a technical term for um, vectors and matrices and wave functions. And, and orthogonal orbitals, you, if you mix them together, you get zero. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. Um, there are examples of what you're talking about if you involve d orbitals, um, but I don't have any off the top of my head that I can I can think about or or, or give you. Um, others. All right. Let's use the PY orbital and remember, according to our coordinate system, the P, uh, 2 PY orbital would be coming out uh, towards us. I'm just going to recopy our coordinate system so we don't get confused. I'm going to draw our carbon hydrogen trigonal planar methyl right there and then the 2 PY orbital we're going to represent with a circle here and a circle there. This is sort of the lobe in the front and the lobe in the back. Hey yes? Shouldn't it be coming like the same direction as the hydrogen coming out at us? Yes. Okay. So it is. We're, we're looking at it side on, slightly adjusted so we can see the stuff in the back. Okay. Yeah. So it stays the same direction as that all right, so we start with the 2PY orbital, which is coming out at us. Um, and if you want me to slightly alter our coordinate system to more closely resemble our perspective, I suppose that's eh. Um, we can make this one work by having an S orbital on this hydrogen and one in the back, but having them have uh, wave function signs that match up with the part of the p orbital that's on that side of the molecule. Notice I'm not putting anything on p the poor lonely hydrogen at the top. Why do you suppose that is? What do you know about the 2PY orbital? It has a node and where is that node? It's the XZ plane, right? The plane of the page. We have a phase switch. That means electron density has to be zero along the page. And what that means is there can't be any orbital density out here on this hydrogen because it lies along the node. Now this looks kind of funny. Um, if we were to draw it, uh, well, if I were to sort of show you what you would see from a calculation. You would see sort of a large lobe here in front. Every time I use the word lobe, I think of Star Trek and the Ferengi. None of you know what the Ferengi are? Nobody at least is going to admit what the Ferengi are. Okay, well, go look them up. They are a, uh, a extraterrestrial group of people that have insanely large ears and um, they call them their lobes and they like people to scratch their lobes. Um, I don't know why I said that. That's kind of strange. Sometimes I have to have something to talk about while I'm drawing. If we looked at this from the perspective of sort of uh, down the C3 axis, what we would see for this orbital is the node here in the XZ plane and uh, then we would see a large lobe here and another lobe there. So um, I guess it depends on which way we twist it as to what we're going to see. Yeah. Just real quick, going back to the other hydrogen, can you think of it in terms of like that hydrogen's S orbital is canceling out? Sure, I suppose you could think about putting one there, and it doesn't matter what choice you make. 
you're going to get a plus interaction here and a minus interaction there, and so it would tend to cancel itself out. Yeah, that's a, that's a perfectly fine way of thinking about it. Um, but this is going to be general, general for orbitals that we make. Uh, atoms that lie along nodes don't have anything on them. All right. Um, one, go ahead, question. Uh, wouldn't that not be symmetric? Is this symmetric? Um, it is with, well, it's anti-symmetric. If this is the XZ plane, which happens to be a node, this is anti-symmetric because it looks the same, but the wave function sign switches. Um, however, oh, hey, I have that leaf blower. It's a very good leaf blower. Um, actually, my son Dallin, we went on a walk the other night, and Dallin was on his scooter, but he also had the leaf blower, and he was using the leaf blower to propel himself on his scooter because he was lazy. <laughs> Um, took him a while to pick up speed, but he did beat us around the loop, so um, apparently there's something to it. Um, new travel of the future, right? All we got to get is somebody with COVID spitting into the leaf blower, and then we can cause issues. Um, the other, uh, another element of symmetry here is actually the X, Y plane, which is actually a mirror plane of symmetry, and it's symmetric with respect to that. Um, what do you think about... Uh, we'll call this orbital B, and this one is orbital C. What do you think about the relationship between B and C in terms of their energy? Degenerate. Good. What does that mean? What does that word mean? Okay. Degenerate in organic chemistry means same energy. How can you tell they're the same energy? have the same number of nodes. Um, yep, perfect. Same number of nodes, same symmetry features. Notice that this one looks basically, once we're done, basically still looks like a px orbital. Uh, and this one, once we're done, still sort of looks like a py orbital. Have the same, uh, same symmetry, uh, same number of nodes, same shape, different orientations, so they are uh, degenerate. Okay, um, and that is, now let's see, let's order them in energy, what we've got so far. We started with um, three plus four, seven atomic orbitals, so that means we got to get seven um, molecular orbitals out. Your text calls this antibonding sigma type orbital E, and your text doesn't draw the antibonding uh, corresponding out of phase combinations for B or C. You could do it, you should try it, it's trivial. Um, it doesn't matter because those orbitals aren't filled. Um, there's one other orbital we haven't used yet. So you've got orbital B plus its out of phase. Uh, compatriot, orbital C plus it's out of phase compatriot. What are we missing? What's left? Yeah, the 2PZ orbital. Why can't, and, and that's going to just look like you expect a 2PZ orbital look aligned along the Z axis, why am I not drawing anything on the hydrogens? They're all on the node. Okay? If they weren't on the node, I could draw some stuff there. But they're all on the node, so the orbital can't be there. Um, and so we'll call this orbital D. If we were to rank them all in energy now, we would have A as sort of our lowest energy combination. Yeah, go ahead. So orbital D is basically Orbital D is basically just a regular P orbital. It's not a bonding orbital at all. It has no S character. No S character, yep. Um, so we'd have A as our lowest energy orbital because it's made from all S types. 
at some point higher than that, we would have the degenerate pair of B and C orbitals. And these are pi type in symmetry, though I'm not sure your text calls it that at this point. Um, and then we would have the D orbital, um, our D molecular orbital, which is just the 2PZ shape. Um, and let's see, we would also have at some point the out of phase combinations for B and C, and then highest up we would probably have E. Okay? Yes? Um, it does, but unlike B and C, there is some CH bonding character for B and C because you've got electron density in between the C and H nuclei. In the 2PZ orbital, there's no such thing. It's a non-bonding Yeah, it's a non-bonding orbital. Okay. So, yeah. D has only P character, B and Z have some S character. Now, what do you think you would get if you mixed this one with that one, with mix A, B, and C together? Three sp2 hybridized orbitals. So you can do that mathematically, and it's totally fine. So you can go backwards and f you can go from molecular orbital picture through a mathematical transformation back to localized bonds. If you mixed those three together, then you would have A, B, and C come down to the same energy. Um, you might ask which reflects reality. Uh, you can do experiments with methane that show that the, there are two different kinds of electrons in methane, two that are lower in energy and six that are higher in energy. But um, it's perfectly fine to use either the MO or the uh, valence bonding uh, pictures. Now, we've started with a fairly symmetrical molecule, this trigonal planar methyl. And we've derived the molecular orbitals. And it was kind of messy, but that gave it, uh, but you can go to the notes and see them uh, arrayed in a more straightforward way. What we're going to do now is, is uh, something that was pioneered by uh, chemist A.D. Walsh. And the idea is we can take a structure of high symmetry and then distort the molecular orbitals, distort its geometry towards something else, and then see what that does to the orbitals. So uh, suppose now, and we just happen to know that um, CH3 cation is planar, but what if we wanted CH3 anion? Uh, and when we, when we finally look back, once we've done this, we'll be able to tell why CH3 cation is planar versus CH3 anion is, is, is trigonal pyramidal. But what if we wanted to distort our planar CH3 to a trigonal pyramidal shape? That is... We take the flat thing and we grab onto each of those hydrogens and let's say we pull them back to the left to get this. Now the top CH is still in our XZ uh, plane and it may continue to be useful to us for a while to have our, oops, copy would have been just fine. <clears throat> Coordinate system, just to remind us. Yeah, I suppose that's okay. Um, let's start with our lowest energy orbital A. Okay. 
uh, and recall that our lowest energy orbital A for the trigonal system, it throws me off so much, you guys, that my iPad tells me it's 9.41. I keep looking at the time, and I keep getting the wrong time. Um, oh, good. We're using the right microphone. Um, let's take our A orbital that has this sort of sigma type symmetry. Okay, and we'll represent its energy with this little line. What do you suppose happens when we go from A to uh, the planar A to our trigonal planar, our trigonal pyramidal version? What's going to change? Does, does any, the hydrogens are going to get closer together. Overlap between the carbons and the hydrogen, should the carbon and the hydrogen, should that change too much? They're not getting that much further away. Uh, bond length may change a little bit, but it's a small effect. And actually, the hydrogens themselves are a little bit closer together. So uh, when we distort the structure of a molecular orbital, when we change the geometry, we're going to see energy changes that reflect changes in orbital overlap due to what we've done to the geometry. So um, we've got basically no big change in CH overlap, but we're going to have some modest small HH overlap as the H's get closer together. So, based on those arguments, we would argue that this, based on that, we would argue that the A orbital <clears throat> goes down in energy maybe a little bit. Um, so, I'm going to draw a dotted line. Geometric distortion gets you there. Go ahead. Yes, going down in energy means more stable. And well, if the if the hydrogens are overlapping in phase, that is a favorable uh, a favorable stabilizing effect. And so it's not it's not a big one, but it's a it's a decent sized one. <clears throat> okay, good. Other questions. All right, let's do this for our orbital B, which we made from the 2px. Oh, shoot. Are we going to have time for this? We're going to barely, we're going to sort of not have time for this. Huh? OK, we'll do a thought experiment in anticipation of what's coming next. What do you think happens to orbital C when we distort from planarity. What's going to happen to that hydrogen? Is it going to still be in the node? Well, actually, since I'm using the 2py orbital, that node is going to continue to be the xc plane. So yeah, these are going to move back. This is going to move back. Still no orbital density there. How about the p orbital? If I start dragging these things this way, are they on the node anymore? No. no. And so what we're going to do to D is now have favorable overlap between these hydrogens on D and the yellow lobe on the P orbital. That's going to turn it from a non-bonding orbital into maybe a bonding type orbital where we've got some stabilization. Okay. Um, so we'll pick up with that next time. In the meantime, stay safe, wear your mask, don't get COVID, wash your hands, don't spit on stuff, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>